Hello, everybody. Welcome to Milkshake Monday, episode 77. I'm Anita Helm. I'm Pastor Helm's wife with Resurrection Baptist Church. And as we are commemorating, remembering Dr. King's legacy, I want to leverage something that uh, has some similarities in what the actual civil rights movement did with uh, Dr. King and Mega Evers and the Freedom Riders and all of the people that sacrificed their life. And I think it will have some merit about what we're talking about tonight in battling the lie of insignificance, AKA you're nobody to God. In what Dr. King, I was a young child, he's been um, dead for some time, many decades, but some of the same things that he was struggling to share with the people men and women of all colors, races, gender, and classes, we're struggling with today. And that's to say that people, men and women, boy or girl, black or white, whatever ethnicity, are insignificant based on the color of their skin or their ethnic or racial makeup or anything like that. Dr. King gave his life, he gave his time, his treasures, his talent, and sacrifice so that we would all understand that we should not be judging one another on the external things of what we see. And we see that happening now. And I think even when you think about Christ, Christ went to the cross for our sins. And the thing that he wanted us all to understand is that he finds each and every one of us significant enough that he gave his life for us. Doesn't matter how we look, how much money we make, what our, the job is, how we feel inadequate in every different way we can think of. But tonight, we're going to delve into that because the Lord has been really impressing on me that a lot of us are struggling. And some people may say it's self-esteem. I'm not saying self-esteem. I'm trying to say just like that horror movie where they, they call the operator and they check the phone and they said the, the actual thing that's, that's scaring the person they say it's it's not outside, it's inside the house. And what you find is that externally people are making you feel possibly insignificant and you yourself, inside of yourself, is telling yourself in your thought life that you are insignificant and that you don't matter to God and that for yourself, you are nobody to God. And you may wonder, how did you get what you're teaching about? It was because I was listening last week to three people who were explaining why they were atheists or agnostic and they didn't believe in God. And one of the young girls, and she was a beautiful young girl, and she said, even if I were to believe what you're saying about God, he is so significant and I'm so insignificant. Why would he even care about me? And it struck me because a lot of times when I think of unbelievers or atheists, it's like when you don't want to look at somebody's channel that you don't agree with. When you hear them, it almost makes you think, ah, oh, I don't want to hear that. But when I listened to what she was saying and I listened to what other people were saying, I was convicted and cut to the heart. I was pricked of the heart because I was convicted because I was not seeing and understanding that this young woman and some of these men boys and girls have lived a life that they are at this place where they say there is no God. There is no God. And when we die, we go to the dust and the grave and it's all over. There is no God because I don't really need him. He doesn't really help my life. And I don't think there's a God because he's too big and I'm too small and that just doesn't make sense. I'm too insignificant for him to really care about me. And so I started saying, God, I really want to share some truth and something very simplistic about why you are so significant to God, that God put time and effort into you individually, that you're not an accident, that the things that you are looking and judging yourself with and critical, I mean critical of every flaw, every mistake, everything that you're saying, oh, it's just not good enough. I'm not good enough. God is saying that's a lie from the devil. Because, you know, there's a difference between the word W-O-R-D, the word of God, the W-O-R-D, and the world, W-O-R-L-D. That L is the lie. It's the lie of the devil. To say, 
You're not good enough. He doesn't care about you. Oh, look what you've done. Those are lies from the devil. So I wanted to break down some things to you tonight because I want you to know you are important to God. You are significant to God. When you hear these scriptures, we're not just throwing out scriptures to you. We're saying that God loves you. But because some of you don't love yourself, because you don't know or have not experienced love unconditional, when you hear that God so loved you, you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure he did. Sure he does. But I don't love myself. I don't want to see myself on a picture. I, I look too fat. I, I don't want to see, I don't want to hear my voice because I just hate my voice. I don't want to see me in that clothes because, oh, I got them bulges. Oh, I don't like that because my teeth got gaps. I don't like myself because my hair is thin. Oh, my hair is, is this way. My eyebrows is this. My nose is too big. All this stuff, you're critical and you're critical. And it's not even coming from the outside. It's coming from your inside. And when you start to act that way on the inside, you don't realize something about God. And I wanted to show you something. I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 2. Brother Mike, when he started talking about stewardship, he started touching on some of the, the scriptures that I wanted to hit on. I said, go ahead, Reverend Mike. If you haven't heard his teaching about stewardship, I pray that you go there. But I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 2. And I want you to understand something about God that you may not get. And I'm hoping to simplify it for you. But God says he's rich in mercy. And that mercy isn't just because salvation is a huge part. We have to repent. We have to receive his free gift of eternal life. We have to receive the spirit in our life. But we have to understand that each of us individually is so important to his plan. You have a purpose. You have a reason why he created you. He created you with your nose and your mouth, your DNA. You know how DNA, we used to learn in science, but I want you to understand that God put his DNA in you for a reason and for a purpose right now for what he needs you to do. But in Ephesians chapter two, it says, but God who's rich in mercy because of his great love, and great, listen to this, great love with which he loves us. Put your name in it. He loves you. He loves all of us so much but his great love not a little not a little teeny anchy love oh i'm gonna stop loving you because oh you don't look right today i'm gonna stop loving right you because you sin today i'm gonna stop loving you because you are fat today you're you're poor today you you ain't right today god says he loves you he loved us in spite of knowing every little thing about us that's great love he says in verse five even when here we go. When you keep saying you are nobody, you're nobody to God. He said, even when we were dead in trespasses, that's sin, guys. It said he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been given to be saved. And he raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, that's a now, that's right now. That's right now when you're saying all those nasty things about you. Oh, you're sick. Oh, you look awful. Oh, you're poor. Oh, you did this wrong. You did that wrong. He says, in ages to come, he said, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to jump over to verse 10 because when Reverend Watts is teaching, these words I want you to hear, and I'm going to say them slowly, for we are his workmanship. When you are a carpenter or you're a person that works with your hands and you take great care, you are his workmanship. I am his workmanship. It's no accident that I got this nose, they got these boobs, they got this hair, that I got this pear-shaped body or whatever body. It's not by accident that all these things on the outside, but you got to go and understand God doesn't care about the outside. He doesn't care about that stuff. That's the stuff that we take too much time to think about. And every time we put so much focus in that, God is saying, that's not, that's not why I love you. That's not why I find you so significant. That's not why I came so that you'd have life with me, that we can love one another together. I don't care about all the external stuff. I really don't care that you're taking this medication. I don't care that this leg is swelling. I don't care that you're skinny. I don't care that you're fat. I don't care about all that stuff that you're getting hung up on. But he says, in this case, he says, 
For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, where's the beforehand? If you have a moment, jump over to John and look at John chapter 1, verse 2. And it says, all things that were made were made, were made through him. And if, it, if the scripture says, and without him, nothing was made. So guess what? You are made by him. I was made by him. And his workmanship is not shoddy workmanship. He does great things. And you're not made inadequate. You're not made insignificant. It wasn't an accident that mom and dad had this stuff one night and you came and it's like, oh God, just, oh, she just popped out. No, he knew you from the foundation of the world. But I want y'all to see something. Because we are allowing all of this insignificant in our feelings, it's creeping into the church. And the behaviors of how you're feeling at home, how you're feeling in the mirror, how you're talking to yourself when nobody's around and God is listening to you saying, that's a lie of the devil. That, that child don't understand how much I love her. That child doesn't understand that I came to die for her and him. But we are walking around hearing the lie of the devil every day. Every day. You wake up, you look in that mirror, and it, oh, I, oh, look at my face. That's just not the, oh, look at this. Oh, look at that. This, and, and you know, there's a scripture that we do when you go to communion and it says, examine yourself. God's examination of us was never about the outward appearance. But everything that we examine is about the outward appearance. And God is saying, I want you to look at your heart. Out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. And the things that you're speaking to yourself are showing how insignificant you feel about yourself. And when you're feeling insignificant about yourself, you're looking at others and you're judging others by that same eye view of insignificance. And when you start to judge yourself that badly, you know how you judge other people. And that's coming in the church. So I want you all to jump over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Chapter 11 is talking about that we're supposed to do this in remembrance. That's the actual Holy Communion. When you remember Christ. And when you remember Christ, you don't remember Christ and say, oh, he looked like that. No, you say, that's the person who created me. With everything that I want to criticize, how I look, how I feel, how all the stuff on the outside, that's his workmanship. And we don't get to go back and say to God, you did it wrong. You you didn't do it right. You, you shouldn't have made my legs shorter. You shouldn't have let me be deformed. God said, I didn't make anything deformed. I made you how I wanted you to be because there's a purpose for you in the body that you have. And I want you all to go to 1 Corinthians 12 and I want you to see what he says because what's happening, the church is having all these schisms. And I inside the church, with church to church, denomination to denomination, the black congregation, the white congregation, the Korean congregation, the, the Hispanic congregation, the Russian congregation, the, the Gentiles, the, the Jews, all these schisms. But we say we love Jesus Christ. We're all following after him. We're all remembering him. We're all examining ourselves month to month as we doing the Holy Communion. But I want you to see what it says in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. It says we're all supposed to be under this one, one faith, one baptism, all from the same spirit. But jump in where it says in verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, I want you to see how many times it says many, many members. And I want to talk about the members because if all of us are feeling insignificant to God, then we're bringing that in the church. And you have a whole congregation of people that are feeling insignificant. And when you're feeling insignificant, you're going to start to have schisms, divisions, and you're going to bring that kind of ungodliness into the house of God. And you're going to wonder, why are these chairs empty? Why is there not love in this building? Why is there not forgiveness and understanding and compassion and mercy and kindness and long suffering? Why? Because we have the people of God that say they love God, but they feel like God thinks they're nobodies. God thinks they're insignificant. God thinks they're ugly. 
the sin that we all live is ugly. But he says, I've come. I've come to give life. And life more abundantly. But he wants you to repent. But look what it says here. Many members, but all the members of that one body, being members are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Here's this oneness, this oneness about the many. But what's going on? Here's where it says, for in fact, the body is not one, but, but members. It says, it's not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body. And you have that every week. I go into the service. We only have a handful of people. Oh, you want me to sing a song? Oh, I don't sing it as good as Sister Sister Helm. Could you get, get her to sing? Because I just don't. I hear that foot saying, I, I, I can't do it because I'm not the hand. Oh, you want to pray? Oh, you need to get, you need to get that person because I just don't know how to pray. But God is saying that we're many. He needs us all. And he's got workmanship in each and every one of us. He can't have us on the sidelines. He doesn't want us on the sidelines. He wants us in the game. He wants us on the field because the harvest is ripe and the labor is few. He wants you to labor. But he says here, here's what's going on in our churches. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body. Here's that back and forth of the members. I don't do how good she does it. And why don't you have her see that mess going on? And what's happening is you're thinking you can't do it because you're telling yourself you're not good enough. You can't do it as good as her. You're comparing. And God said, I didn't do my workmanship for you to compare what I gave you with what I gave him. I've given you the gifts I want you to have. I've given you the purpose that I want you to have. But here we go. Here's all this talking in verse 17 of chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. If the whole body were an eye, if everybody was like me, Lord help us. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? And if the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? Each of us has a role. Each of us has been given a gift. Each of us has a purpose. But you can't stand and live in insignificance because you'll miss out on your blessing and you miss out on what we need in the body of Christ. But it says in verse 18, but now God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased. Do y'all hear that? He's pleased with how he created you. You're not. He's pleased with the purposes and gifts He's given to you for his purpose, for his divine DNA in your life. He's pleased, but you're not. You're still listening to the lie of the devil saying, you're not good enough. You never were good enough. Why are you even here? The lie of the, the father of lies, whose whole purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy your life. And guess where he starts? In your mind, in your insignificance that he keeps telling you. Every day, every day, you're insignificant. And God is saying, that's a lie. That is a lie. Because you're his workmanship. He made you. He knows your thoughts are far off. He knows your inward parts. He made your substance. You're not an accident or an incident. And you're sure as heck not insignificant. But here's what he says, as he pleased. Verse 19 says, and if there were all one member, where would the body be? If we don't have you, where are we going to be? We're going to be less because we need you. We need what God has purposed in you. We need all those talents, your temperament, your behaviors that you understand, the things of God that he's put in you, not the flesh, but the things God has put on you. And he says here in verse 20, but now indeed there are many members yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Member number 10, you can't tell member number 150, I don't need you to be here in this church. I don't need you to be here in participation in our worship service. I don't need you because we can do fine by ourselves. That's not the place. That's not what you do in the, the, the house of God, not your house, because it's as he pleases. And he says here, 
He can't say, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. But when you start to bring insignificance in the church, you start to have these schisms because the people don't like themselves. So therefore, they're not going to like you or you because they're thinking, I'm not adequate. So I got to be nasty because I'm feeling so inwardly upset about who I am. You don't even realize whose you are. And that's that internal game that Satan is trying to put on you to make you think that you're just not adequate. Why would God care about you? Oh, just give up. Oh, if you die, you just go into the dirt. Lies, lies, lies. It says here in verse 22, after you say, I have no need of you, it says, no. These easy two letter words that we just go so fast. No, you're not. God's not going to let you get away with saying you don't need to have sister in the church because he pleases to have sister in the church. You can't say you ain't going to have the brother in the church. No. Verse 23 says, no, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. You can't say because this chick just comes into the church and she don't know, as you think, oh, she don't know how to dress. She don't know how to talk. She don't know. She's exactly who God pleased because he put her DNA together. And she's coming in to the body that's many body, one body, many members. And her part fits for what he needs in that church, that congregation. It's necessary. And her weaker, even if she's weaker now, don't mean she's going to be weaker or he's going to be weaker for long. It says, verse 23, and those members of the body, which we think, now here's the, here's the talking, here's those talking sisters in the corner, which we think to be lesser. Here you got to listen. And those members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. You know why? Everybody always talks about the pastor, the pastor's wife, the deacon, the trustee, all the big wigs of the church. So they think. And they always got to be on the dais. I used to say I never wanted to be a pastor's wife because I don't want to be on anybody's dais. I don't want everybody to be looking at me and focusing on what I got as my hair and what I got as my outfit and my shoes are they coordinated. I didn't want all that attention because I just want to be Nita. I want you to see Nita in the grocery store, Nita at the bowling alley, Nita on the job site, Nita at the church. I'm the same. I, I don't want to be all this stuff because when you think you're something, you're, you're forgetting who you are. And some of the people that we see, like the presentable parts of the body, we have so much attention on them that you have to realize all of us are sinners. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No member is more elevated than the other. That's something that we started. That's that crap of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes that they wanted to be seen for all their long robes and their fancy prayers. They thought they were significant in their own self. None of us are significant because of ourselves. We're significant because of Christ. That's the thing. The lie of the devil is to say, oh, you're significant because your cars. You're significant because of your, your job. You're significant because of your bank account. No, that's a lie of the devil. What profits a man to gain the whole world? Like we got all these people gaining the whole world. They can buy all these $50 million houses and mansions and cars. What profits a man to gain the whole world and to lose his soul? And what profits these people in the church that don't love one another, that don't respect all the members of the body? I'm not talking about resurrection. We love one another. But I can see even in resurrection, even in the churches, even in the families I see, even in the, the friendships I see, that there's a, a, there's a problem with people feeling inadequate that they are not worthy of God's love. And it's a lie of the devil. It doesn't matter if you're sick. It doesn't matter if you don't have money. It doesn't matter if you're bald, if you've got all kinds of issues of all the things that you're looking at yourself and say, I just don't measure up. Guess what, saints? He came knowing none of us measured up. We were all going to a fiery hell. And he said, I love him. And Satan knows that if he can just convince us that we are unlovable, that we are insignificant, that God doesn't care about us, 
All of a sudden, we want to commit suicide. All of a sudden, we don't want to go to worship. All of a sudden, we got too many things to do that have nothing to do with God. And we have to remember that he loves us. He says, for God so loved the world. But guess what? We are don't feel lovable. So how can we even hear that scripture? We don't hear with this ear. And I'm not talking about physical ear. I'm saying an ear to hear. We don't hear about the love because inside of us, we got the lie running in it. That lie. Remote control. Re re rewind it. Satan's so going to hear the lie again. You're not worthy but God. Rewind it again. Oh, you messed up. Rewind it again. You know you're a sinner. Rewind it again. And God is saying, remission of sins, I've wiped it away with my blood. Come back to me, babies. Come back to me. This scripture here, and we'll get to the end in a second. It says here in verse 23, And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need, but God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. That the members, all of us as one body, should care about one another. And part of that caring is to tell your brother when his head is low, when he's feeling down, you know, like God loves you. You hear me? God loves you. You ain't got to try to fix everything. You can't fix everything. God loves you. You know, when y'all see Rev on Fridays or Sundays, whenever you see it, I always want y'all to understand, even in his suffering, he could say, I'm inadequate as the body because I can't see right. The stroke has taken away my vision. I, I'm inadequate. He could say, I'm insignificant, God, because I, I, I don't have my uh, hand, my left side don't work right. I'm insignificant because, you know, somebody probably could do it without hiccuping. I'm insignificant because I, I, somebody could probably do it better. They, they're not as weak as I am. But God, said, God has put into my husband's heart, you do it because I have fashioned you. And I know what you're capable of. And all I want you to do is go on out there and be willing. I'll do the rest. Hiccup or not, just proclaim my name. Proclaim my son's name. But there are people that can see better than Rev. There are people that can talk better than Rev without hiccuping. There are people that have their whole left and right side working. There are people that can stand up and do all kinds of cartwheels and flips. But guess what? They don't want to be a part of the body. They don't want to be a part of the many. And I'm just sharing with you that we got to be part of the many. Even when you think that you're insignificant, you have to remember God loves you. You are his workmanship. He has created you. And I wanted to leave you with the scripture that I have read many times, but I want you to hear it. Hear it from the bottom of the heart of the Lord who's loved you so much to give his son. Psalms 139 says, for you form my inward parts. It says, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I ain't on a discount. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. You're part of his works. You're part of his workmanship. Marvelous are your works. And that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you. That's us. Our frame was not hidden from him when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me when as yet there were none. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O oh God. You can't listen to the lie that says that you're nobody to God. Did you hear what he said? Precious. He says, how precious are the thoughts of you and I to God. How marvelous is his work toward what he made you to be. Stop crapping on all that you feel inadequate about yourself. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Satan knows how precious you are to God because he knew Jesus came for you. 
and he's done everything in all of your life to tell you how inadequate, insignificant you are because he wants you to quit. He wants you to give up on God. He wants you to stop worshiping God, stop praying to God, stop having a relationship with God. So you just quit and you believe the lie that, oh, you just kill yourself. Oh, just go on because you're just going to go to the dirt and, and, and that's going to be it. God made you. You are made in his image. You think that he did all that work for you to go in the dirt? You ain't going in the dirt, honey cow. All of us are going to have to give an account for this life. From birth to this natural death. But we going on. Heaven or hell, we going on. Because his workmanship, that's some fine work. Marvelous works, do you hear? So he knows. And he wants you to know how much he loves you. He wants you to know that. But the enemy doesn't want you to know. So I think there's a battle raging. The battle is in our minds. Because God said, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Well, if you know Christ's mind, he knows how much he loves you. He knows how important you are to him. And you can keep remembering. And I want you to think about this. DNA, everybody's heard about the scientific word. I'm going to change it for tonight. Divine nature assessment. Divine nature accessibility. You say, what's that mean? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is available to you every day. Whenever Satan starts to beat you up, mm, you you no good. Mm, I don't need to talk to you. You don't need to talk to God. You got you got you, you need to get in touch with your DNA, the divine nature accessibility. That's the Holy Spirit in you. You need to get into your DNA and say, Holy Spirit, help me. Holy Spirit, help me wash away these bad thoughts in my mind. Holy Spirit, help me to put my mind on Christ who made me. Help me to remember that he's always thinking about me. He's always aware of where I am from the time I, I sit down and time I raise up. Get in charge of, of finding out the DNA, the divine nature, accessibility of the Holy Spirit. He's there with you. He's there to tell you you're loved. You're not forgotten. You're not alone. You're not ugly. You're not insignificant. You are loved by God. And that's what I wanted to share with you this day. Because we, we got to get, the battle does belong to the Lord. That's for sure. And he's given his life. He's given his son. But he needs you all to start recognizing who you are in Christ. Whose you are. And that he's got a divine purpose for you. I love you and Lord willing, I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.